Welcome back to Trampled Underfoot Podcast, hosted by Mark Lindsay and Eloy Escajedo. We go live every Tuesday at 6.30 on the Pacific Coast and 9.30 on the East Coast. That's Trampled Underfoot Podcast coming right at you. How are you, Mark? That was almost professional. That sounded real good. <laughs> I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm just living the dream, like they say. Well, good. Um, what dream is that? Well, I got my driver's license renewed today, so I'm legal until 2029. Whoa. <laughs> it's only like almost a month late, but uh, that's, you know, that's one of those things to do with COVID. You go to make an appointment to go get your, everything's appointment now. And you go to get your appointment made. And they said, yeah, the next spot's April 20th. And I'm like, dude, I turn into a pumpkin day after tomorrow. That's you know? incredible. Well, we do. I So I got mine renewed just say, well, this, this past month, uh, because we're both uh, of the same month. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was surprised you could do it online. Yeah, we, we ain't sophisticated enough for that yet. You know, you go to the DMV's website and it says online renewals begin May 1st. I'm like, gee, thanks. What year is this, Oregon? Come on. Oh, it was fantastic. But now the only problem with the whole bit is that you have to renew every so often. I forget what it is. I guess it's the same or maybe different in each. I don't know. But the funny thing about doing it online is that they send you your license over the mail, but you've got the same photo you did yeah. from way back when. And I, I'm here to tell you, I don't know if I took a straight on uh, sh head, sh you know, mug shot. Mm -hmm. um, if you put my face next to me now that I would look the same whatsoever. In fact, I'll show just for the, by the way, we go live on YouTube, and we also have our Spreaker um, show. So if you're listening on Spreaker, you can always visit us if you want to see the the uh, the video as well. You can see it over on YouTube, Trampled Underfoot Podcast on YouTube. But um, I don't even know if it'll – so, okay, so this would be – well, let me do it like this. This would be me now. <laughs> this would be me now. Um, well, me now is me now, me now. Yeah, you were a little bit younger, but still, you can tell you're the same person. I mean, you know, it's not like you've got the full beard you used to have. You can still oh, that's right. the same person. So you could tell, right? It's not like you're going to oh, say, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Well, but it's kind of weird, you know, that you're looking at yourself from so long ago and there's no, like, so would I be like 80 something and they'll still send me one of when I was like 15? Well, I don't know how Florida does it, but uh, down in Nevada at the time, uh, you could renew online. Then the next, when it came up for renewal again, you had to go in and have a new photo taken and do the vision test and all that other good stuff. But gotcha. Now, the state of Nevada had an excellent, excellent system. Uh, it was, I mean, there was no uh, smog inspection or anything in our area anyway. And they had machines set up. You could, you, you inserted your renewal documents into the machine, paid with your ATM card, and it spit out a new registration and stickers right there. And they had those machines, you know, in a couple of malls. There were about eight of them out in front of the DMV headquarters. You could pay with cash or with a check or with your ATM card, whatever. I mean, you know, just boom, boom, done. Ten minutes, you're gone. That's great. It was it was excellent. And you could renew online. I mean, good grief, we could renew online. First time I did it was 2006. So the state of Oregon is just now moving into the 20th century. Thank you very much. And, yes, I meant 20th. <laughs> it's much better on on so so look the fact that you have to dish out money on top of money for all these different government things, not to mention through the taxation, not to mention all the just the whole barrage of this, this and that. Um, the fact that you could do it, the 
my words, not anybody else's. The fact that you can easily get mugged on doing it online uh, is much more convenient than having to go and wait in line with with a truckload of people and this and that. So, oh, yeah. um, I I like my 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 stick 'em up cowboy. Um, give us all you got events done virtually. Yeah. Um, it's can, much better. You can cuss at them through the monitor while you're doing it. Right. You don't so. have to put up with one person's <laughs> attitude. If they have, let's say they, that one employee, is, they didn't have a great old uh, evening last night uh, or whatever. But, you don't have to put up with those different human, you know, character flaws when it comes to interaction. So I, I like that. But to be, to be fair, you can get that at the cash, you know, the checkout register at the supermarket too. Yeah. You know, right, right, so, right, right. But yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, there. I'm not, I'm not by any, so it's not, well, I'll tell you this much. The, the person at the cash register in a general sense at the, at the local grocery store is not sticking you up for, you don't have to be there. Yeah. So True. there is a difference. Well, you don't have to be a DMV either. You could ride your bike. You know, well, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to operate a motor vehicle, if you want to X amount of things, there are requirements and they're not True. asking you <laughs> there. There's there. So, you know, be instead of parsing the words, I'll just say that, that of course we're all human and ubla di ubla da, <laughs> but I'm just saying that when I, when I get robbed, I like to get, uh, stick them up, cowboy. Um, it's better online than than yeah. through uh, having to actually be. I'm there. with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, you know. I'm, I I'm will say. You. I will say that. But yeah, uh, are they human? Yes, I'm not suggesting they're not. They are human well, beings. That's true. Some of them are, you know, pretty sketchy. You, yeah. you wonder at times, but uh, yeah. Well, no. That's, the only that's all the way across the board. Yeah, no. The only component I'm 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 not happy with is the 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 force of payment. You know, <laughs> you know, well, that's the only yeah, part that I really do? don't. Exactly right. So that's the only part I don't like. Like everything, I mean, that I really don't like. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's 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 the key. You know, you can't fight city hall if you want to drive a car. This is what you got to do. Exactly. So. Exactly. That's all right. I do but, it. But, but thankfully, on, on, uh, yeah. the state of Oregon, our licenses are good for eight years, so I'm not sure what ours are, but so. it's been a while, yeah. In any event, so nothing, dude. Um, I so I, I do have a little story that might open up okay. some conversation, you know. Um, so you know that I'm not too, I didn't grow up being too aware of the Wild West in reality other than what we see on TV and like little, you know, novellas that you read or cartoons and stuff like that. Like it's not really my over here in Florida. It's more of a Caribbean angle. Right. So you're, you're, so it's more of, although the old West, I grew up watching old West stuff, but it was like Bonanza. Right. And so on. And I've really delved in into read, but when I say delved in, it's not like I can recall everything. So what I'm going to tell you is just something that I read. Okay. Right. And, and maybe you, you'll dig it. So there's, there's newspapers you can research through online. Right. And they have old American newspapers going back really old and it's great stuff to read. Um, you get a vibe when you're sitting alone reading late at night, an old newspaper from like the 1800s or even earlier they had. Yeah. And you get a certain, like, it feels cool to be sitting and, and reading it on your monitor, by the right. way. Um, and so I came across, uh, since I was doing the genealogy, I came across uh, doing the genealogy, a article in El Paso. And there's a family, there's branches of family that are called Escajay Da. Okay. And I've been tracking them recently because... Mm -hmm. I want to see if there's a connection. I think there is, like absolutely. And they had, but in any event, in El Paso, there's a, a place just slightly outside of El Paso from way back when, um, early 1800s, if not earlier, um, pre, you know, 
pre-U.S. when it was just territorial, um, you know, areas and whatnot. But in 1870, there was an event. Now, in this article, it says, you know, the newspaper, uh, we were we were wondering about the events from so long ago, a hundred, almost a hundred years ago, over here in in El Paso, Texas, about the Salt Wars. And I read the title, The Salt Wars, on the paper, and I was like, holy smoke, The Salt Wars? That's weird. It's a, it's almost like grocery, like yeah. items. And I'm like, oh, I don't, do I read it? But it had the an escahey, duh, with the A at the end in it. So I said, well, I'm going to have to read it because it has that. Maybe there's something there that might link me. But I ended up reading something in interesting apart from my research. And so he said, here at the newspaper, we tried to figure out the oldest person we know that was around during the Salt Wars. And we found Mr. Escajeda, Mr. Escajeda, mm -hmm. from El Paso. And we went to talk to him to see, because we knew, and it says, we knew that he would tell us the truthful thing uh, about the occurrences when he was very young. He was a bait, like a child, young. So it ends up, the story ends up like this. In El Paso, Texas, when this was like warring factions and and just the the, the West, full throttle, um, Mr. Escajeda witnessed in the town, that little town, they would go, the citizens of it, out towards the, the desert, and there was these flats that had salt. Okay. And they would mine it. And for generations, they would mine it. They would take the salt and they'd travel to Mexico and sell it in Pueblos in Mexico, or they would sell it in other parts of North America. You know, whatever the trade-offs would be, they would go and sell these wagon loads of salt. So okay. this town of El, of El Paso, or just outside El Paso, a, I guess it would be in today's terms, like let's say I live in Sweetwater. Mm -hmm but I still call it Miami, but yeah. we're still removed from actual sweet water. And we're talking minimal amounts of people, right? A few thousand people. It's not like yeah. there was a hundred thousand people living out there. That's not the case. There was very few, which is also interesting. So they would go out and get, but a guy comes into town and he notices the salt and he says, well, this could be a thing. And so he went to the local whatever um, authority and purchased either the rights to the land rights to or the deed indeed or something to that if they don't know which one but he took control of the flats and he posted that from this point on no one can touch the salt something that these people had been doing for such a long time and the people didn't like it and so they said and although this was posted the people of El Paso said eh, you know what eh. And they kept doing it. They kept going with their wagons, collecting wow. the salt, and selling it. And this guy, this entrepreneur guy, um, and forgive me, I don't remember all the names and stuff. It's something that I read the other day. He didn't like that. So he started uh, sending uh, law enforcement, the, the rangers, to go out and arrest these people. And these people were not. They're like... They've been doing it for generations. It's not like these people are like c yeah. city folk that, oh, you have to wait for the light to turn red, you know, all of those. They were just living out, you know, right. in survival land. And so it ends up that a war ensued where the town folk armed themselves. And this guy, this entrepreneur, armed himself with the sheriffs and and um, what do you call these people? The uh, the rangers, rangers that were and... brought down, mm -hmm. and this was like eighteen seventies, eighteen you know, within that time frame. So it was like, and they fought it out for like days in El Paso, shooting block to block the citizens of El Paso against the sheriffs and the this and the that. They ended up taking over. The 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 uh, citizens, uh -huh. they won. Oh geez! And they took, they killed one ranger, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other people died. But they say one and one citizen, or no, a lot of citizens passed. And so they took them, and they took the judge because the judge 
adjudicated that this guy had indeed the rights because he bought it. Uh -huh. But these people are from like the country, the desert. They don't give a crap about that. You know, they're, I'm sure if it's a situation where you took my, my bag of beans, mm -hmm. you know, Mr. Judge, look what he did. But in the case of something so vast, they think, what's the damage of taking some salt so I can make some money? And so, but they took, they, the town took control of the sheriffs and the so on and so forth. And they held their own little court. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is wild. What They sent them packing. All of them. And they took off to, I think it was New Mexico. The guy, the entrepreneur guy went to New Mexico. And the town was there and stuff. And once they left, they got reinforcements and the sheriffs and deputies and everything came down on the town. And in the article, mm -hmm. it says this was one of the darkest moments in the early history of El Paso and America because of the death that ensued because they ravaged the town. And the thing is that they quote in the thing or they mention in the thing that the deputized people, Mm -hmm. were the lowest form of scum. They just deputized people because they needed men. And they had no value of of the sancti sanctity of life and this and that. They came into the town and freaking shot people left, left, and right. And so this Escajeda was witness to all these events. And so the article goes on into more details and this and that, and it wraps up. So I, I just wanted to share that with you. What do you think about that, the that, Wild I West in that? Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's Wild West, all right. Um, just doing a little bit of um, research, looking at it here, just a teeny tiny little bit. Um, that happened 1877 and 1878. So it was long after the Mexican-American War. Um but I thought that Texas was a state by then. Well, remember, I gave you the generalized yeah. thing, so I don't know what the details. So I'm kind of surprised that federal troops didn't come in. You know, well, maybe they, they did. did. They did uh, send eventually. in. They did send in. According, this is according to what I read from that mm -hmm. particular. They did send in rangers. I think they said, "Aren't they federal?" Uh, no, they're Texas state. Oh, okay. They are they're 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 not federal. But uh what else have you Yeah, looking at this this fight lasted for 12 excuse me, 12 years. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, San Elizario Salt War. That's the place wow. San Elizario. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it uh started in 1866 and finally ended in 1878 with that that you're talking about that massacre there in El Paso, but yeah, it, they kept stealing the salt for another 10, 11 years until oh. he finally gathered all those people up. But what would you do? Seriously, if you've lived for generations I mean, and there's a place out and it's like, it's a hard concept to look at from a per, the perspective of a, so if I'm out in the woods in America today, I know that I could be on either a federal like park land or whatever mm -hmm. or private property. Right. But I don't know that there's anything not attributed to a specific. Well, we're also looking at this with the 20th century, a 21st century view. Right. We have a different mindset. These people, like you said, have been doing this for generations. And a lot of them, I imagine that was their livelihood. That was the way they made a living. Yeah. You know, take the salt down to wherever it was, sell it, buy supplies and come back. And the next time we need to buy more supplies, we just go get some more salt, take it and sell it and <laughs> yeah. do whatever. I mean, you can eke out a living that way. But we are used to... I mean, we were just talking about it with the driving thing. We're used to more regulation, and we know now that that land, no matter where we go, belongs to somebody. So, you know, and just because you 
own some land doesn't necessarily mean you have the mineral rights. It's presumed in some places um, and it's automatic in some places, but not everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, you can see it from both sides of the, from both sides of the fight. I mean, you've got people that have been doing this for generations and then all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, I own that. And you're like, yeah, right. You know, it's a tough call because it's so much air. So the, so somebody owned it before. I don't know the details, but the idea of, of like who owned it before, but apparently somebody had the right to give over the, the ownership to this uh -huh. guy, this entrepreneur yeah. guy. And by the way, they, 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 they captured the judge. They captured the guy. Yeah. They captured the sheriff. I mean, they and they and they they did a little trial for themselves. They told them get the heck out. Um, and people wanted blood and stuff. And there were some there that were like, no, 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 you know, let's get. And they sent them like miles on mm. on out towards New Mexico. And they said, okay, keep going and don't come back. And they left. But they came back with mm -hmm. reinforcements, and that's yeah. when all hell broke loose the other way around. Um, and, and so, I can understand them doing it for generations. Land that's open, mm -hmm. nobody's been there, and all of a sudden, a group of people say, "No, that's this is all." Imagine somebody back then telling you, uh, "Mark, you see this hole as far as your eye can see on every in every direction. That's mine. You can't step on here." But there's nobody ever been there nobody you know what do you and oh and you show them a paper yeah. and, this, and this paper says you can't they would not take you serious because there's no right. precedence in their history look, go back and look at the history of texas and oklahoma and kansas and look at the cattle wars that went on when people started claiming and buying land and started putting up barbed wire fences you're talking yeah. about areas that people had grazed cattle on for, you know, however long. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, here comes a guy with a piece of paper and he puts up a barbed wire fence. And yeah. people were knocking down fences and everything else to graze their cattle. You've just blocked off all the water. We can't, you know, we can't water our, water our cattle out here now. And yeah. range wars were fought over that. And that was the inspiration for a lot of Western movies and TV shows was... You know, range wars over water, over pasture, over just being able to drive your cattle to market. How do you tell somebody? How do you? So, number one, there's two. It's a clash of civilizations because one civilization uses documentation and precedent. The law. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and the law. Although the other, they also have a law, but it's not as, as um, codified on paper and there's different tribal and there's very, very, and, and likewise with the, the, let, let's say the European. Um, but if you come at those people that have not had that experience and you show them a paper and you say this paper, <laughs> think about it, like removing all that, you know, about like documents and papers, somebody comes at you, you out on the prairie and they say, this paper says that the land that you're standing on, sir, you're going to have to move 20 miles that way. Okay. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people died. You know, a, well, you know, this gun says it's mine. So get off my land. You know? right. right. So it's like incredible. And, and this is the salt war was just one of, them. I mean, there were a lot of shootouts and gunfights and just all out warfare of uh, bands of people coming in and running ranchers off of their land that they'd been on. Um, then when um, certain areas, it's a little bit further north. I don't know if they did it in Texas or not. People started bringing in sheep. Oh, my God. You'd have thought that they had just, you know, slapped your wife and pet your dog. <laughs> you know, sheep on cattle land. Oh, man. So it's it's so I so. Reading that the other night mm -hmm. in here, it's weird, right? Um, I really got to, and I actually, believe it or not, I, I thought about you and Steve, actually, because you're always <laughs> talking about books and stuff. But I had this sort of like little shell cocoon into the world. You're looking at the newspaper because they, they've scanned mm -hmm. it. So you're looking at the old newspaper and you're reading it. And the first thing that came to mind, I've read old newspapers before. 
But every time I do it, I read it uh, something new. I can't help but be reminded of something that uh, that that I could be that I could take for granted very easily since I'm since I'm such a modern individual in this this technologically mm -hmm. advanced world and I'm so darn modern and and you know this and that um, there's always something that I'm reminded about is how eloquent and not even beyond eloquent just above par they would write mm -hmm. and obviously it's not always the case because you could read if you go through a lot of them you'll see some um, but in general the exquisite I don't want to say penmanship, but uh, typography. Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, it, it but yeah, very, it, was, it was the way they wrote back then. The way they structured awesome. sentences and structured articles and things like that. Yes. And, yeah. You know, now you know why I like to read. I've not done as much of it here in the, past, the last year, year and a half as I used to. I used to read every night. Oh, wait a second. When you say now you know, uh, like to, don't let's not imply that. So, well, I'm not saying you don't know how to read. I'm just saying I know you don't like to read for recreation. It's just not a thing that you're interested in, and a lot of people aren't. It's no big deal, but yeah, you get wrapped up because the mind creates the scenery, and you get wrapped up and invested in the story. At least I do, anyway. My recreation when reading is, and I can't help but but elaborate because I don't want to. Uh, for the record, you know, Eloy didn't like to. No, um, I would read a lot when I was a kid, a lot. Right. I'd read philosophy books, biographies. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot. Okay. Right. Um, but then there was a time then I s stopped doing that and mm -hmm. it, because the internet actually overtook that and I right. can read it. through. So in the course of investigation, that's where I draw my, you could call yeah. it entertainment via investigation, but it's not like me reading a story Right. Um, for the sake of just enjoying a story, a book or whatnot online. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. So in that respect, yes, I, right. I totally do not. Right. It's just, yeah. I don't know. I, I just, don't. I haven't in a while either. It, it, and it's been quite a while. I mean, I got totally immersed in the complete works of Sherlock of uh, uh, the Sherlock Holmes, um, Arthur Conan Doyle, the complete Sherlock Holmes works of Arthur Conan Doyle. Good God, Mark, spit it out. Phew. Um, just one volume, everything he wrote about Sherlock Holmes. And I just got involved in that. And I probably I read that probably, oh gosh, five times over the course of a year. Just because you'd finish a story and it would just go right into the next one. And you could start at the beginning of the book and just start over i mean it was it, it's great stuff excellent writing like you're talking about you have to kind of work your way through the vocabulary a little bit because they do use different words for yeah. things and some of them are a little bit strange but uh you get through that some good stuff <laughs> I, I i do have to re retract and I did it before, but just since for for some reason it popped into my head, I do have to retract something that in a previous episode, I don't recall which one. Um, but by the way, we have so many topics that we talk about, um, ranging from music to history and adventure and strange facts about oh the world and just life, the universe and everything, and you can actually check out those past episodes over on our Wayback Machine button over on our site, trampledunderfootpodcast.com. So if you want to catch our past episodes, they're all listed there. Um, but I have to retract that in one episode, we were talking about something to the effect of digitization and modern times and conserv conservation of information and that I mentioned, and I was a very strong proponent proponent of saying that, dude, it's all digital, and it's so darn convenient, and in fact it is, but I poo-pooed uh, significantly. I said, you know what? We don't need – what what the use is there for libraries anyhow, the physical product? You know, it, I'm all about the digital. And for convenience sake, I'm all about the digital, but – I've had to retract that because of the one obvious thing. And I think I did retract it before very you early did. on. But the idea of not being able 
So if all the electricity or whatever, for whatever reason, we didn't have access to all this valuable information online, where would we go if not a library and collect private collections and collections held in museums? So um, I retract that because we need the physical items really badly. In fact, we had a discussion about that, and I posed the question to you about with library attendance being down so low and libraries closing because people just don't use them anymore, but they still have value. My position was they still have value if for nothing else for document storage because Mm -hmm. museums and the like don't have the funding to store and conserve all these works, but libraries do, they get the funding. Most of the time, not always. Yeah. And so they'd still have value as a place, as a storehouse. Because, yeah, you can go online and you can read the Declaration of Independence. But you got to go to Washington, D.C. and go actually see it there. And then it's a copy. It's not the actual first one with the original signatures. It's a copy of the originals. It's a copy of the original, yeah. In other words, um, they made more they, than one. Original. They they did, and they printed. I don't remember how many of them they printed out, but there's not very many surviving. And in fact, I was watching. I don't remember what I was watching, but some guy bought a uh, bought a, a picture at a thrift store because he liked the frame. He didn't care about the picture, and he got it home. And he opened up the back and he pulled off the cardboard back and behind the picture was one of those copies of the Declaration of Independence, one of the uh, originals. Um, And he, you know, of course, put it up for auction where it sold for several million dollars. But my goodness. But he bought it at a thrift store. (laughs) That's insanity, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I still get into... You know, I haven't been to the library in quite a while. I'm one of those guys as well. I look it up online and I read it or I read the books we have. But I've said it before. I'll say it again. I married the daughter of a librarian. So I read out of self-defense. And she is one of those people that still buys books. In fact, she got all excited a little bit earlier today because one of her books that she just bought shipped this morning. So she's happy. She's happy. She knows it. She clapped her hands. So I, growing up, in reference to my my family, my parents, well, my father and my grandfather, my grandfather at his, you know, 70s, 80s, he would, re, he would have a lot of those little thin novella books of the Old West. So he was mm-hmm. totally into reading Old West stuff. There's a culture... There was, there was always a culture of the Old West as an intrigue, the West, the West, um, growing up. And he was a, a Spanish man. He was a Spaniard, and but there was an intrigue. And I would I can't extrapolate from that, but I would assume that there was a strong sense of adventure attached to it. And maybe that was a culture of his generation that they were very interested in the Old West. Not never ever necessarily going over there, but the adventure was there, and he would read that. My dad also had stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of everything from well books as well as um, al- almanacs mm-hmm. dating back to the 1960s. He, I had when I cleaned out the shed, I had them put in bags. Um, originally, and then I had to re-clean out the shed. I said, what am I going to do with all these almanacs? And there was so much information, important family information, plus then the stuff that he, and I had no choice, but I mean, I did have a choice, but I have no space. And so I got rid of those almanacs. Um, There were so many almanacs. So my dad was quite the reader. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a reader. I don't know to what extent other than what I said. And then I was more of a comic book reader, getting into biographies. And then I would pick up stuff like, you know, Plato, because mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to expand the mind and learn and, you know, philosophy. 
but I never sat with like the say Tolkien book or a space adventure book and, and was able to really get into it. Um, I wanted to know the story of real people. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I did a little bit of everything and a little bit of both, all of the above. I mean, we have everything Louis L'Amour ever published here in the house. So a lot of Westerns there, but also believe it or not, a lot of detective stories. He started out Louis L'Amour, the Western writer started out writing detective stories for a magazine. And he com later in his life compiled them all into a uh, one volume and called it The Hills of Homicide. Yeah. But he also wrote stories about World War II in the Pacific. He wrote stories about uh, medieval times. Uh, he wrote a story about a an American who was captured and imprisoned in a Russian gulag in his escape out of the uh, Soviet Union. And it was, it, 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 I mean, some good gripping adventure stories. And maybe that's where some of that came from, was the adventure and the allure of the Old West. Now, again, though, you're talking about growing up in the 70s and early 80s with your grandfather. Westerns were huge back then. I mean, up until the mid-70s, Westerns were the number one form of entertainment, whether it be movies or television. You know, most of the movies that came out were Westerns. Most of the TV shows were Westerns or had a Western theme. If, if you look at you and I now removed, you know, the amount of years we, we are, when we think of looking back, we could go all the way to like, a guy and a gal sitting on top of a, you know, rock eating apples, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be doing this, but in, in, in a more real <laughs> sense, we look, I should. So my grandfather, I'll say it like this. My grandfather being born in 1911, mm -hmm. seeking out adventure from the past, he would have thought I was born in that. And I'm just assuming this, but I was born in 1911 so he was like 18 years old in like the in 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 the 1930s, early 30s, mm -hmm. 1930. He was 18 years old, um, something thereabouts. He would have looked back for his reading and adventure into the 1800s, which would place it, you know, 1911 back. Like for me, 1975 going back into the 60s. Notice how I love the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Beatles and this and that. Because I look back and, man, there's secrets back there that are so curious that I want to explore. Um, for me. I was the same though, way about the 50s. You see, so that's, so I'm thinking that they were thinking in terms of cowboys and this and that. Because it was removed from them enough, it, not enough that it was so distant in time, but just right. You get what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Uh, but something else to remember is that he was born in 1911. That is right at the tail end of the Old West. Right. You at, know, at the tail end. Yeah. Right. It's exactly at the tail end. Because, like, Arizona didn't even become a state until 1912. So it was, you know, a lot of lawlessness was still out there when he was born so he wasn't that far removed from it so here in the stories i mean and eventually later on reading the books it's something maybe he could relate to but maybe not so much but it was pretty close to his lifetime well the beginnings of his lifetime anyway yeah. and I, I i know that listening to my parents and my grandparents talk about things. When, when I listen to my grandparents talk about the 30s and then the 40s, I got that cool vibe as well about how, how different and how cool things were back then. And listening to my mom and dad talk about it, the, the 50s and early 60s when I was just, you know, a baby, there was a coolness about what was going on back then too, more so with the fifties and sixties, because I'm a car nut, always have been a car nut. 
the 50s and early 60s were all about cars and car culture and hot rods and drag races and this, that, and the other. And that just always appealed to me. And then I'm listening to the music growing up. That's all mom and dad ever played was oldies just about. Yeah. So I was listening to Bill Haley and the Comets and I was listening to Elvis and I was listening to, uh, you know, the Beach Boys and uh, the Platters and the Dell Vikings and all these other groups. So it just kind of was a natural fit for me. So yeah. I can kind of see your grandpa's interest in the Old West because he wasn't that far removed from it. And with the 50s, like my dad, when I ever had a conversation, rare as it was in, in reference to music, because he was all about, it's a weird thing, but what I'm into right now is kind of more or less where he was at, mm -hmm. but with a different urgency and purpose, you know, documenting assassination of people, real people, and calling on the phone and letter writing to people to find out how did this person die in this political situation and just all these. So he was, and then he would document it. And so, and I, I'm doing it more as a historical thing. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, as opposed to, you know, it, 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 for me, it's a historical thing. And he was more trying to, you know, build up the accurate history as it was unrecorded, let's say. I'm just yeah. looking for things that have been recorded. It's not like I'm going to um, state libraries and trying to discover never before recorded. It, it just, you know, it's a, it's different in my mm -hmm. mind. But he would talk about Bill Haley and the Comets and Elvis as his reference point. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, in, in passing, because I would say, oh, rock and roll, this and that. And he says, no, oh, no, no, no. Bill Haley and the Comets mm -hmm. and Elvis Presley. Buddy and he Holly would, and the Crickets. Yep. But, but he wouldn't um, go, pa like, for him, past that. Mm -hmm. It's a, a non topic like it's well, not that's the way that's the way my mother was my father was a lot more i mean my father was a lot more open and he i mean good grief he talked my mother into going to see the movie woodstock and he brought home the soundtrack to the album you know my dad brought home the first credence clearwater albums blood sweat and tears and the guess who and all them others and i latched onto it and i'm like this is cool you know and so I he was proceeded to wear him out. Yeah, he was more adventurous when it came to music. Mom, you put on Nat King Cole or Bobby Vinton, and she was a okay. I learned about Nat King Cole through my mom. I learned about just a bunch of the and and it's funny because the the fifties and sixties um, artists that we would look to look at like um, lovey dubby stuff. Mm -hmm. um, she had albums of. Oh yeah. But to us now looking, and I like, um, so like, let's say um, what's that guy that, that, that did um, boy, I can't, he was very famous uh, Italian guy. He's probably still alive from the 50s, uh, Paul Anka. Paul Anka, um, okay, yeah. So she was totally into Paul Anka. And um, in the context of like a kid like me growing up, you're not thinking, of, you're thinking instead of Paul Anka, you're thinking of Elvis Presley or Little mm -hmm. Richard. But she didn't have none of the, she didn't really have the Little Richard. That wasn't, it was the, the Paul Ankas and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So I kind of appreciated that side too, although yeah. it can be classified as, you know, uh, lovey dovey. You're gonna hear a loud. Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to kill a fly here on on air. Let me, let uh -oh. me. Oh, I'll let the, the the audio. That way you got that, it. That way you know when to it edit survived. this out. Dude, it survived, dude. It's still buzzing. Newspaper, Son. newspaper resistant flies. This just in from the trampled underfoot newsroom. Newspapers are no longer good enough. Use your tablet. <laughs> Film at 11. Now back to the studio. <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about cataloging and libraries and physical, actual uh, materials mm -hmm. that are historical. Uh, the other night, I saw a documentary or news bit, extended news bit about Prince, the artist. Mm-hmm. 
And um, they went and visited the actual facility, which is this huge sort of, you would not expect, it's not a house, it's a building. Mm -hmm. And upstairs was where he lived. And then there's a the floors. They've got, so you walk in and it's a museum for him. And there's a huge hall where people can walk in and it's kind of, I saw it and it was, it was eerie because you walk in and you know how Elvis has the, the suits on display on mannequins. Mm -hmm. This Prince had his suits on mannequins. He has a makeshift studio showing how he recorded um, his guitars. It's like a whole museum for Prince. And on the, in the basement, there's what they call the vault. And in the vault, and by the way, they, they that's where all his music is kept, right. um, the physical. And they mm -hmm. say he's got over 8,000 songs recorded um, and that they could release one for the next who knows how many years. Yeah. And that it's now it now belongs to the estate because he never wrote out a... This guy never wrote out a will. He's got family. And they're all vibing for it. There's troubles uh, back and forth with it. But the vault contains all that in the basement. Uh -huh. And what happened to him is that at some point he did an interview and he said, oh, I've never I have not been in the vault for years. And people were, were wondering, well, why wouldn't he go he'd be in the vault? And it later came out that he forgot the combination of this huge vault. Oh, no. <laughs> and he started to, they, they eventually opened it, but um, he started to add his music. And, and the reason why he probably never put out, I'm just assuming this, but uh, uh, put out his a lot of this music was probably because he just forgot the combination and he left it in there <laughs> and said, screw it. I'll just write more music. Yeah. Well, he started adding crates of music outside of the vault in that room, that entrance area. Mm. And it was full of music as well. And so now there's an actual company that manages that. And they put out his music every year. Mm -hmm. They, they, and in the meantime, the family's also fighting for, because he never left. Yeah, for the money and for the the all that stuff, and I just found it an interesting, um, just interesting, well, and and that brings about a good point because we were talking earlier about the importance of library. We can't discount the importance of private collections because museums have limited space, libraries have limited space. Now you're yeah. talking about how much stuff Prince left behind when he passed. There is no one facility other than where it is right now that can hold it all. And they just right. don't have the people and the money to conserve it. So our own private collections have value as well. And yes. we just have to make sure it gets into the hands of somebody who will value it and conserve it as we go. I mean, I we tease all the time, Linda, and I tease all the time about the number of spinning wheels that she has around here. And some of them, they all need a little bit of work, except for like eight of them. Eight of them are good functioning spinning wheels. The rest of them need some work, but some will never work again. So we're at the point of conserving it, not so much restoring it, just because it is a piece of history. But there also comes a point where you've got to really assess the value. Is it going to be worth anything to anybody down the road to continue conserving? It's like if you go to a museum now and say, I want to donate a loom or a spinning wheel, they'll say, sorry, we got no room for it. They have so many of them because so many millions were made. There's just no value to it. Right. So they have to stay in private hands. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to sell uh, uh, one of the old treadle style singer sewing machines, they know that antique shops won't even look at them. A lot of thrift shops don't want them because they made so many million of them. They're just not valuable. That's a big you know? problem. Um, I mean, you make quantity in order to service a public that has demand for a certain item. And, and sure enough, it's out there. But 
but if many survive as the years go on, you get that situation you, you, you've just explained. And I'll just say in the context of something that I'm familiar with slight a, a little bit is with comic books, the old stuff were printed in smaller um, batches and hold amazing um, value, like very expensive in the millions in some cases, like Superman and so on. Um, even if they're ragged, but yeah. as you come into out of the 60s and 70s, in the 70s, now they're still holding value. Into the 80s, they've actually increased. Maybe some of them are, are, are highlighted ones, but in general, you might get an extra 50 cent, an extra $7, an extra $20 from that magazine you bought for 75 cent, 80 cent, a dollar. Right. But now... In the in the two thousands, the amount of printing that's going on for comic books, and this in particular throughout the the nineties, was so vast that things don't hold the value. I mean, they just don't hold the value. So yeah. as far as collection, you're looking at maybe a hundred years out when this is going to be right. of value. Maybe because age maybe. doesn't necessarily mean value. It depends. We're back to the uh, treadle sewing machine. So many millions of them were made that even though it's, you know, over 110 years old, there's just no value there because well, everybody's got one. Well, they would have to. So, right. Exactly. So the only so the thing I'd add to that is that we'd look 100 years for like, let's say stuff now mm -hmm. in the event that most of those prints disappear somehow or another. And there's yeah. very few left. Then all of a sudden. You have you have something because there's rarity right. involved with it. But that's other than that, it. that's what yeah. drives it is rarity. And that's why I say that private collections are important in that regard, because it's more than just saving or conserving something of monetary value. It's saving and preserving a piece of history, because whether we think so or not, every one of us has a story and that story has value. It's 100%. going to have value to somebody down the road because somebody down the road is going to be looking for you and they'll want to know your story. So as much as you can leave, you know, documentation wise to the next generation, you know, or to the, the ne people in the next generation who care enough to preserve it. That's when the, uh, that's how that stuff gets perpetuated. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm real glad I got my father to write out his story before he passed away. And he made several copies, sent one to each of my daughters and to my brother and to his family, his extended family, cousins and what have you. So somebody down the road will have his story. You know, that's an amazing gift. Uh, number one, so not even number one, just it's an amazing gift in, res in, 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 in respect to himself making the effort to do this. And, and also as important, the, 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 the ability to transfer so that people can see with their eyes right. the specific words that he put down to mm -hmm. describe his life. Mm -hmm that there's you can't there's no price no. that you can add to that uh, i mean Zero. i'd love to i'd love to find that from my great grandfather my great grandfather died in 1965 i was 4 years old i vaguely remember him his wife my great grandmother she lived into the 1990s she used to tease me constant, constantly about she was going to outlive me just to piss me off and she was almost right a couple times <laughs> but so i spoke with her a lot but I never really talked much to him that I can recall. Cause like I said, he died when I was four. So if I had something in his handwriting or something that he typed talking about growing up in this area in the 19 teens and twenties, you know, uh, that would be really, I mean, just blow your mind. Cool. Yeah. And that's so. the reason, you know, 
I was left with all these things, and I know we've talked about this, but the idea is that now I have all these things. When I mean all these things, a lot of documents and stuff, and the story, you know, this this particular story of this particular group of people that exist, or I'm sorry, that existed um, in the world during these decades is my direct story of my ancestors and that story doesn't exist outside of with me it might exist in parts if somebody met like let's say somebody meets your dad and they had some sort of you know connection and maybe the connection right. was to a particular discipline um and so then there's a piece of that but only you have the complete or most complete story of your recent ancestors and um, what do you do? You know, you could do anything. You could just not do anything like most people sure. do with all these pictures and letters and information. Or you can opt to put them together and do. And so that's kind of what I, I'm involved in doing. Yeah. But I don't have the I, I didn't I wasn't born with the skills to I wasn't uh, educated with the skills to do all this. And I've had to educate myself in order right. to do that. Um, but what I found is an, an incredibly enlightening personal history that is of so much, there's no value that you can add to it because it's beyond that. And so as long as I, I'm thinking digitize it and push it on, you know, out, and then it's done. My job is done. This is the best that well, one can do, you know. To a point, let me ask you this about that. I would be surprised if there wasn't a Cuban genealogy library somewhere in the Miami area. There is. Would they be interested in some of the physical pieces you have? I don't know. I haven't. There, there's a. I'm actually. I subs. I am um, subscribed to a Facebook group that's called the Cuban Genealogy Something or Other, and there's a section in the library. Uh, the FIU library, mm -hmm. and um, some of these people are faculty and teachers mm -hmm. and stuff. And so there's a whole section. I, I don't, I've not visited it, so I don't know I, what the details are. I would talk to them. They may be interested in copies of what you have, because yeah. you can't be the only person with those surnames looking. I mean, because you've got a bunch of surnames in your family, and you may be the answer to somebody else's brick wall. I mean, that's what we're doing. I mean. Um, the genealogy library here in Phoenix, Oregon, thank goodness, survived the fires. I mean, it got close to them, but there's a lot of family histories that would have been wiped out had it burned. But, yeah, as you know, as, putting it in as many places as you can because I know you're putting them online and what have you. But I will be, I mm -hmm. will be doing those mm -hmm. things, and then that that you're suggesting now is is like you know, really a, a no brainer. If I don't do that. You know, then it, other people won't have access to it that would go to them. I mean, I mean, the stuff the, that you, the, the stuff that you feel like parting with. I mean, you know that. Uh, it, obviously, they would probably take copies of the things that they think would help in searches. But uh, if I know them, anything they can get their hands on is valuable information, and it's another offsite storage place. My dad wrote a book in nineteen eighty. Well, in the beginning of the 80s and published it in 83 and it was a novel and um what he went and did was he sent it off all across the country to libraries mm -hmm. so that they would have the physical copy i mean that's what you did back then yeah you had the physical copy that's it this whole yeah. digital thing is just a mind-blowing we've seen so now his book exists out there in libraries so people can mm -hmm. actually go to the library and um you know uh, mm -hmm. pull it, you know, and whatever. But um, the idea of the di digitization of books is something that's started to go on. And we, we could go into um, Google books and there's a lot of books that ha are starting to be digitized um, mm -hmm. that are, and I'm not talking in reference to like, let's say Lord of the Rings and this and that, which we know mm -hmm. there's a lot of books that are sort of obscure mm -hmm you know, even like data information that are right. being scanned. And so the volume of information that's being 
brought to light is larger than anybody can handle. So, right. you know, the final thing I'll say is that my family search, um, which is the Mormon um, mm -hmm. genealogy, they have a ticker, which I showed you one time. Right. If you go into their site and you go and search images, which means things that have, they have scanned, right. such as books and, and, and confirmations and all sorts of, you know, land documents, the ticker is running wild. Like going mm -hmm. to, and you can click in and see what's new and stuff. It's not indexed. It's just pages and pages of stuff that's, that's running. Guys. Yeah. And it's mind blowing. But so in this ocean of, of human, you know, documentation and all that, we all exist. And um, stories like the San Elizardo, um, El Paso thing, um, that's in newspapers recorded and stuff. I would never have run across it if I my curiosity wouldn't have taken me in that direction. Um, I, I'm all for the physical items now, um, yeah. because if digital goes, you know, bye bye. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, one yeah. electromagnetic pulse can put everything can just make everything disappear. Everything's gone, and you're yeah. left with nothing but the physical. Well, you have no, you you do have a hard drive that you can use as a paperweight. Yeah, you can drive a nail with it, and you can chase down that damn fly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because what good, you know? I mean, that's that is a big deal with with this whole um, mm -hmm. digit digitization. Um, we have a, a you know physical things that that contain the, and then it disappears magnetically, and you're screwed. You know what we have just learned. We're what? both old people. Why why'd you say that? Because we like the physical thing in our hand. We want to <laughs> hold that thing in our hand. Now what's your newfangled iPod? Get that out of my get that electrical doohickey out of my face. You know. <laughs> it's so true though, but you know, there's good reason. There's good reason, dude, because oh yeah. I mean, so yeah. like like currently I have a have a oh, digital pizza and tell me how full you feel. Yeah. I like the physical. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you know, currently, if it, all the information, luckily it's on the site, uh, Ancestry uh -huh. site. But for me here, the amount of pictures, dude, I have a folder. And the amount of actual documentation that's come to me, I literally have my great-grandfather's birth certificate in my hands. I have... Mm -hmm so many documents yeah. in my well see that's an error um in my possession digitally i have them in my possession although my cousin did say i could send you the 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 copies uh over the uh atlantic um but i said no no i'm good with the digital i'm good with the digital yeah no that's fine so long as it's you know so long as it's put in a couple of places of storage you're good so yeah, so um well we went all over the place. We went from San Elizario Salt War to rock and roll of the fifties and sixties to museums to but that's what we do on the Trampled Underfoot podcast. That's right. We um go live every Tuesday at night. Well, at night on the east coast, nine thirty, and on the west coast. 6 30 p.m. And you can catch us here on YouTube, Trampled Underfoot Podcast on YouTube, as well as over on Facebook, Trampled Underfoot Podcast on Facebook. I sound like those jazz uh, uh, radio stations um, it, where the guy's just talking. And now we have something from, you know, Nat King Cole. Check it out. Uh, so, yeah, thank I was you guys. Getting I was getting vibes of Venus flytrap from WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> um, so, and we're also sponsored by Steve Nealon over at Harneal Media. See, I'll put on my Barry White voice now too. Well, maybe not quite Barry White, but I get by. Harneal Media, your one-stop website shop. The man, the myth, the legend, webmaster to the stars. Web hosting, web developing. For you and your small business. 
You want merch? You want t-shirts? You want baseball caps? He can hook you up with a virtual store on your own website. That's Steve Nealon over at harneelmedia.com. <laughs> you know, that would have gone a lot smoother if you weren't laughing in the background. No, right? because All right. It's cool. Because I just, I just, I'm listening and you said um, to the stars and I couldn't help but think of Star Search. Remember back in the... <laughs> and, and it... <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Sinbad. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, so listen guys, hope you enjoyed it. We will catch you next Tuesday and have a great rest of the week. See ya. See ya. Okay, we'll make that clap sound so we can see it in the uh, audio editing software later on. Uh, Rick French says, value is in the eye of the beholder, but in the wallet of the potential purchaser, which is why I can't sell my complete collection of the Monkees albums. Dude, some <laughs> of them might be worth some cash. You know? Well, <laughs> if, if they're the albums, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, but guess what? You know, years and years and years from you don't know what turn of events. Maybe the monkeys will be looked at because you don't know, right? Maybe the monkeys they'll find a musical sound shift within their song, a pattern that they used to, and they'll say, "Wait a second, we've been wrong all along." The monkeys were geniuses, which they they're yeah. brilliant, but you know, um, they were geniuses because this musical shift what, did not occur, and then all of a sudden you have monkey mania. 200 years from now, for some reason. You don't, yeah. We don't know. You never can tell. You never can tell. <laughs> I, 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 I doubt it, but... Um, you can't say that. I mean, I mean, there have been so many revivals of so many weird things. I'm waiting for Bet Rocks to come back. You know? That's a I, tough one. I don't think it'll ever get there, but you never can tell. I mean, there's a lot of goofy stuff in the past that have come back. All you have to do is look at collectors. Well, no, we're talking different. There's collectors which are kind of strange because they're very specific to certain items and historical things, um, mm. as opposed to like popular culture. Because you're talking, yeah. will it come back popular culture wise? That's going to be a tough one. Well, you never can tell. I mean, you, you never know. Uh, if you'd have told me 30 years ago that. Uh, the Marvel universe and the DC universe would have come out of comic books and into the big screen. I'd have thought you were nuts. Not, not to the point to where they have, you know, Steve says he needs to find a new copywriter. So do I, <laughs> I don't get it. What, 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 what's that in reference to writing copy for, uh, the, his little spot where we mentioned oh. his sponsorship of the oh. website. Yeah, we, we're winging it, Steve. One of these days, what we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll record an actual bit. And then we'll just add that on to the audio podcast. You notice how I keep saying one of these days. We've been saying that for about a little over two years now. Ain't done it yet. But maybe one day we'll do that. We don't want to. We don't want to rock the boat. Don't yeah. rock the boat, baby. We yeah, see, rock that boat. will never come back. <laughs> oh, that you know, I'm I'm gonna tell you right now, and and I'll and I'll say it, and I'm I am not ashamed to say it. That particular song is freaking awesome. I love that song. It's musically just you can take a bite out of it musically throughout the whole thing. I I really love that song. I know in the context of you living it, it must have been as cringy and horrible as can can he, but. Here's an example of me looking at it quite removed, and I like it. But I'm liking it. Actually, I'm liking it because I like the the melodic thing of it. I'm in, I enjoy that song. I hate I'm, I hate to say it. I just threw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> Don't rock the boat, baby. <laughs> our, our love is like a ship on the ocean. I love it. <sighs> Get into some old Motown, man. And I've got to know where you got the notion. Now, it's just get fantastic. into some old Motown, man. Put on some Temptations and chill out. No, I like that too. See, but here's the thing. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, I, 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 I get it. 
if from from your vantage point, it was like an mm-hmm. attack on rock and roll and civilization in general, like aliens coming from the stars trying to ruin a good. It just thing. wasn't my style of music. I was like, that's how you separated the kids from the serious music listeners. Go listen to your rock the boat, baby. I got other things to do. <laughs> right? No, I totally get it, dude. I totally get I it. I just work to do. <laughs> I like that song. I like that song. I'm not going to sit here and lie. (laughs) I think it's hilarious. Yeah, we have a whole stable of pet rocks out in Rock City. We got one corner of our yard. Our yard is kind of a weird pie shape, you know. And we got one corner that's absolutely worthless. It's about 10 feet, yeah, maybe 12 feet deep. And every rock I pick out of the yard as we're doing our landscaping and gardening and stuff, ends up back there so we've taken to calling it rock city wow so i mean and it's about a foot deep all the way back the whole corner that's uh, insanity i mean what you guys have for <laughs> land ground earth over there is so strangely different than over here well, it's all volcanic so it's clay and rocks and I mean, we're talking everything from the size of uh, a pea up to the size of your head. Nothing super ginormous. We're not talking about big boulders out here that you have to blast. But on one side of Medford, there is a layer of stand- sandstone down just deep enough to cheese people off that they do have to blast. But our soil is black. Over here, our soil is. I mean, you can find yeah. dusty soil, but mm-hmm. if you dig enough, well, if you dig enough, you're going to come into this white, sort of like pea, sort of like uh, rock, pea rock type of uh-huh. like, like it's like corally, coral, and yeah. But there's there's a truckload of. I mean, that's that's. Well, there's a bunch of before that, just dark, like wet, humid, mm-hmm. just soil. You know, no. Frankie C and C says C and C a sign that says Rock City. We're going one better. I've got a big piece of old galvanized tin off of a roof, and we're gonna paint C Rock City on it with an arrow <laughs> pointing towards the back of that corner. Now, for those of you who've never been down south or never been back east, there's an attraction. Rock City. You know, Rock City. Yeah. It's, I've uh, been there. Let's see, what's it? Uh, Lookout Mountain, isn't Lookout it? Lookout Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. And just about every tobacco barn, well, anything that can't crawl out of the way of the advertisers down there has C Rock City painted on the roof. And we ended up there. <laughs> and so that was the thing we picked up, uh, picked up on when we lived back there in Tennessee did, and Georgia and what happened. Did you me. visit it, Rock no, City? Never went there. There's. The only th- thing I can remember clearly about it, and we went through it, you know, um, the, the one thing oh, that, that looked like I had like something there, but it's just one patch of dark beard. <laughs> it's just one patch of, um, I remember there's a part where, and, and my mom was not too keen, <laughs> keen on, and I wasn't either, let's, let's be fair, where the rocks are so close together, but there's an empty space you can walk through, but you have to walk, slide through, and you're like really pressed and they have it as part of the little walk. And we went through my mom and I, I was like, will I get stuck? What happens if I get stuck? And I'm a little kid. Will I get stuck? My, my dad just went right through. Right. But, but my mom and I, we were like, Oh crap. What's, yeah. you know, is this going <laughs> to, I so- never get Linda through that. She's claustrophobic. She won't go into tunnels or mines or anything like that. No way. Not a chance. Them's fighting words, you know, <laughs> My mom and, and remembering, um, and I don't remember that th- this was exactly, but I, 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 if I recall well, um, as best I can, we went down to see the Ruby Falls, mm-hmm. which is in t- Tennessee, and it's an in- indoor, uh, I'm sorry, underground fall, underground, where wow. water comes from the surface and drops, I don't know how, how far down, and we went down, and my mom came down with us, but I think, I, I don't recall if she stayed or if she went back up on the lift because she's like, screw this. And yeah. um, I was a little bit, my, my, again, my dad could care less. He was just doing, 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's always the impression I got with my dad. Like, it didn't matter what the scenario was. Okay, let's go. But <laughs> I was a little bit, I was a little bit more like my mom. More circumspect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more like my mom in that respect, you know. And so I was down there. I was like, okay, this is cool. I want to go forward, but let's think this over. We're underground. Let's can we let's mathematically figure out that you know how safe is this really you know so i'm always thinking those things and yeah. my mom likewise and my dad was like okay let's go come on yep yeah well linda we lived in uh, nevada for 15 years and right there at virginia city not far from us you can go on tours of the old mines go down in the mine shafts and everything in the old comstock silver mines wouldn't get her into one not a chance never happened you know the minute it gets dark and closed in you remember I was telling you about that castle in Germany that we toured where he had created Mad King Ludwig had created this one room in the castle. It looked like an underground, it looked like a cave with an underground river running through it. And it had, you know, crystals that looked like gemstones and everything embedded in the walls. She didn't like that. And it was part of somebody's house that looked like a tunnel. It looked like a cave. But this was in a building, so she didn't like that. I mean, like, yeah, it is a little weird. Um, yeah. We're supposed to be, well, I don't know if we're supposed to be, but we're yeah. used to up outside, open, stretch our mm -hmm. hands out. We've got space above us to the sides. Sure. Down there's down there. Uh -huh. Don't want to don't want to ponder that. There, there's a, a video. I, I didn't share it with you, but I can go back and. It's very weird um, in that the guy has a particular, he's a scientist guy living up in Montana, more, about, more, more or less. And this dude is all about searching for the history of the people of the Americas that came through the Bering Straits mm -hmm. into the Americas. And he, and he wants to discover everything about that. And mm -hmm. and there's a whole there's a whole history of that that's always trying people are trying to put together mm -hmm. and but it's so long ago and it was all verbal there's no written language so yeah right so there's a lot that is like left to like what the heck happened but but he is so into that that he goes and let's say when there's winters and like the lakes froze over up out towards Michigan, and it was like 19, uh, 2014, he mm -hmm. went and said, I want to experience what these people would have experienced with the gl glacial, you know, world glacial freeze over ice age. Mm -hmm. And so he went and tried to trek across the Great Lakes when they were frozen over uh -huh. for that one period. And he took his little thing and he built an igloo and everything. Oh, and he geez. said, I, I want to experience how he's that you know, mm -hmm. and he went down south and he talked to the natives in a certain tribe that were considered one of the oldest of the languages because um, there's different languages. And well, you know, and um, he talked to them and he said, this is a good opportunity. Let me see what they say. Obviously, although he's talking to a Native American guy, mm -hmm. um, this Native American guy is like he was born in, in the world that we live in. So it's not right. like. It's not like he can he, he can yeah. say what his grandfather told him and what his right. grandfather and grandfather. And so he asked him, so where did you come from? Meaning his his people, his tribe, mm -hmm. his story. Yeah. And he said, we came from down there. Mm -hmm. And he pointed to the ground. And so this guy's like, okay, so, it, it, so this is like, this guy is like a scientist guy and he says, okay, so you came from down there. What do you mean down there? Do you mean from underground? He says, listen, we came from down there. That was the only answer. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he and he was like, he pressed them, but the Indian guy kept saying, no, no, no. Listen, you're not understanding. We came from below, from down there. And then he goes to explain the different stories of, of the tribes and this and that. Uh -huh. And he justified it in, in a certain way. He also told him, but don't you understand that uh -huh. DNA tells us that through the Bering Straits and people from Asia 
have similar um, DNA that you can track. It, I mean, you can literally track and then it, it went down and then all throughout the Americas and, you know, and you could see this in the natives. And so he went and explained it. And the guy said, no, 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 we came from down there. So there was no, there's no. And so he explains the scientist guy, the other guy's reasoning. And he goes on to continue his conversation. But I found it interesting. He's totally into that world. Uh huh. And um, and respectfully, he's not being, you know, right, standoffish or this or that. But um, there was a reason for me saying that. But whatever, whatever. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I like I like the we came from down there. And when he uh, tried to explain, the, the the Indian guy would say, "No, no, no, stop." Yeah. Again, we came from down there, and that was it. That's yeah. it. Okay, so don't yeah, keep going. Yeah, it's good going. enough. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, but again, it's a verbal history and that's what was passed down. So that's what was passed down. Yeah. And they respect it and they keep it. And that's, and that's it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and we're, and we're done with that. You can't go further, you know, and this is how it is. It's yeah, turtle, it's, it's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way down, dude. <laughs> but it was an amazing uh, uh, documentary. Uh, but the, again, the guy scientist is is an example of a guy that's involved in a particular category, mm -hmm. and his fascination is captivated. That you can't have that guy sit down in a cafe with friends to shoot the breeze, and that not be in the background of his head because we're all yeah. wired for whatever we're wired what? and we have our certain focus and stuff and this guy is an example of something that many people wouldn't even consider as a thing well you know something that you're doing that i have only begun to do myself is that you're collating all the information because getting getting information and, and learning and the quest for knowledge is great. But if you don't collate that information and put it down somewhere for other people to find, because the things you've <laughs> discovered are worth a lot to you. Right. But if you don't put them where somebody else can find them, it's worthless right. to anybody else. So yeah. well, thank God you've learned that and you're doing that. And, and this brings me to that scientist guy that you were just talking about. Is he doing anything with this? information i'd and have to rewatch the reading movie. books i mean uh, so obviously this was a video about him or by him one or the other it's it's he was the main focus on that and then there was an interview part mm -hmm. um he's a guy living somewhere up in montana and he's got a beautiful house and he says it, one of the things that he said it's dude it's i enjoyed the documentary a uh -huh. lot i shared it with with Greg, because we were arguing one evening after you had left and everybody, Greg and I got into the conversation of, and I didn't expect it to go the, I didn't expect it not to, but I didn't expect it to go where it went. And Greg and I were talking about the Americas and this and that, and um, the whole events of Europeans coming over. And he said, well, you know, the uh, Vikings were, were here first and you know that's just that's that's pretty much it i'm paraphrasing and i could be mischaracterized uh, but he said and, and you know that's it i said well you know i'm not denying that side of it but it's like if indiana jones and this i'm paraphrasing now here mm -hmm. it's like if when indiana jones went into the temple um somewhere in in, in that that jungle and he was looking for that that special stone and there's a guy clawing at it just withered away uh like a skeleton you know you don't say that the guy you you can just as well say that the skeleton that never made it out that nobody knew about discovered it uh-huh and likewise you can say that indiana jones that came in took it and left discovered it but right. you so so but it's just a matter of shifting the idea of useful for who. Right. Yeah. Who reported it? Who recorded it? 
That's right. Because history is recorded by the survivors and the victors. So, you know, I don't think anybody denies that uh, the Vikings came to North America. I mean, we there's physical evidence that they did up in uh, Canada. But they didn't do anything with the information. They decided it wasn't for them. And nobody well, knew about it for centuries. Well, Greg, Greg, Greg did mention something, and which I later had to, and that's how I got to the video of this guy, by the way. But Greg did later mention in conversation. It's not fair to him. I'm just talking in in reference to an interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, he did mention the fact that well, what about a scenario where these Vikings take back their information, but. A, a thousand or you know 800 years or whatever before the christopher Columbus event and he took it back to europe these people took it back to europe these 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 vikings but you know like things developed slowly and people just didn't have the the means or the effort or the interest to go and do what christopher columbus eventually did but the information was there it and and so and so that's a valid, I thought, well, that's a valid thing. But I went back and, and, and read the, the history mm -hmm. um, briefly. I read the history. And what had happened is that in Christopher Columbus actually first went to the Portuguese that were already traveling through Africa down and around. They were right. the, the, the first ones. And right. when I mean first ones, I don't mean first ones. Ever that we don't know because maybe uh, I mean within the first the, of recorded history. Well, yeah, the first of recorded history, and in the context of Europeans right. from the time of exploration on that we understand. So there might be one guy on a lifeboat, you know, bouncing off the waves two hundred thousand years ago. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this particular scenario that sprang from right. the age of exploration. So. Um, he took it to to uh, to them. He said, "Listen, I want to go and find a route instead of going around the Horn. I want to go straight out into the ocean, and that'll get me to India. Right. And then we'll have that." And the Portuguese were said, "No, no, thank you." He went and then took it to the British, mm -hmm. and he he went to the court and said, "Look, this is what I want to do." They said no, mm -hmm. and then he went to Spain, and at mm -hmm. the time. Spain had just just recently kicked out or controlled or took over the last Moorish, Arab, Middle Eastern, uh, mm -hmm. Andalusian culture left. And that was uh, down, I forget the, the darn name of the place, um, whatever. They, they, took, they took that and they were they had unified the, the peninsula. So they said yes. Queen Isabella said, let's mm -hmm. do it. And he went mm -hmm. and he stumbled upon, discovered, or whatever the case, the Americas. And once that occurrence occurred, everybody else, their green lights went bling. Yep. Uh, and that's when it started. But well, Christopher Columbus went there in reference to what I just said, he was right. the first one from the first age of one exploration. documented, yes, because there's something that we're also not thinking about, and that is the Vikings who did come to North America. Do we know that they made it back? That did was they, another question. We know that they came. We know that they left. Do we know that they made it back? That is another question. So it, I did ask that it, question to Greg. And it's quite possible that they didn't make it back. And so the other folks said, yeah, no, we're not going there. I did also. Well, that's a good point, actually. But I did also ask that question. Did they go? Because that could have happened what you said. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm sure that there's information out there to explain it more in detail. But sure. that could have happened that you said. And that could be the story. Or they could have gone there, met the peoples of the Americas, and blended in through marriage and so on and so forth. That could have happened. Or sure. or they could have come and got killed by these people. True. That 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 too I mean well, that too could also happen. So there's a few things that could have sure. happened. They, well, they were there long enough to make physical structures to live in. So 
you know. So, so that occurrence is a part of of history, but it's sure. not what kicked off the age of exploration. No, and it's not. It's not. It, it and just, that was that was that was basically the uh, the Arabs refusing to sell spices because the Arabs were buying all the spices from India and then yeah. selling it to Europe. Well, then the Arabs said, yeah, you know, we're not going to sell it to Europe anymore. And the Europeans are like, what? And then yeah. the Portuguese did their thing, circumnavigated and went to India themselves. And then pretty soon they, they didn't take over all of Africa, but they took over enough to where they basically controlled the Indian Ocean and could defend it, you know. Until the Dutch came along and said, "Yeah, no, that's ours." The the Euro the Europeans tried, mm -hmm. but unsuccessfully, and gave up on it. Going through Europe, through the Middle East, mm -hmm. into India, but yeah. there was so many warring, or not warring, but there were so many you know places where they could encounter opposition along yeah. the way, castles and all sorts of, you know, different groups mm -hmm. that it was impossible to make the journey. Well, yeah. There were in a several empires way. there that were just not friendly at all. Yeah. So it was difficult. But right. on the Christopher Columbus side of the thing, he got to the Americas not knowing, mm -hmm. but he did bring back X amount of native people mm -hmm. and put them and brought them before the court. He said, well, we didn't find, we found brand, we found all this land. We didn't find gold. We didn't find this and that. But I brought you all these people as slaves. And Queen Isabella was horrified. Mm -hmm. And this is documented. Because the thing is this. Even though the age of, you know, colonization and such was beginning, um, she was a Catholic, and this is recorded, and the idea of taking these people outside of their will, for her, she thought of them, anybody that he found, once the flag was put, became Spain's subjects, and therefore for held a certain amount of value as subjects, and they couldn't be taken like this. That was her, her particular reaction to this and he went back and more and, and atrocities occurred and vice versa but he was jailed in the Americas and sent back and he eventually got free of that went back again so he did a few stints over there but after his initial back and forth you know that's as 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 that went on the Americas started getting <coughs> populated by all these European nations and stuff sure. so Diminishing the the putting aside atrocities and this and that, diminishing the idea of and I see it a lot. You know, Columbus didn't discover anything. Well, anybody reading that would assume, oh, so he didn't discover anything. Okay, that's it. Well, that's not the case. You yeah. know, that's not necessarily yeah. you're trying to diminish that because you don't like the political ramifications of that and and colonialism. And I, I understand that, but that's not yeah. where the truth lies. Yeah, we did a whole episode about this about uh, a month ago. Yeah, we did actually. Remember which one this was? Um, oh, it doesn't matter. We did a whole episode, and you can find it on our website. No, we've already done the audio part. We can back <laughs> off of that. Let's see. Well, no. So the <sighs> video that 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 I ended up watching was because I wanted to explore what what um, Greg was talking about, and I found it super awesome like really yeah. freaking badass and so i shared it with him you know if you want mm -hmm. um actually i could post it i don't know if it's something worthy of posting on the uh what that the, video yeah sure why not it's go a very ahead. we haven't a, posted anything in a while so yeah go for it okay um it's very cool because they bring out arrowheads mm -hmm. you know but it has its limited audience. You have to be sure. into a, sp a cer certain thing to dig it. But I like the snow. He's He lives in a snowy area. Just a, a normal American guy. Oh. And he's fascinated with ancient hey, hey, Indian know. culture. And that's great because that's how people learn. That's how we learn about this stuff as we explore and we look for it. So Jim yeah. says, how can you discover a place that 
has people already living there easily. I'll give you an example. This is this is an example. So you can't discuss. So you can't for the people living there. That's not even a, an option. But for the person that discovered it from outside or stumbled upon it, and I'll give you the example. I mentioned it before. Indiana Jones walking through the tomb. He sees a guy clasping the thing. Mind you, that guy's dead. But I'll give you, you know, the example of. Well, actually, I can't give you that that example. I was gonna say that. See now, now I'm stuck but, at finding a good you know, example. Here's a good example. Um, uh, Cook and uh, God, I can't think of his name now. Are credited with discovering Australia. Yes, the Aboriginal tribes were already there, but nobody else knew about it. So they discovered it for the rest of the world. Right. It's not that they discovered it for the people living there. So if you have two unconnected uh, groups of people, and let's say the one group goes and finds a passage and finds a village, you've discovered a village. But not for them that are from the village. You just, you and your people never had a clue. Now, you can change the word discovered if it holds that that much, you know, either negative or positive. You can remove the word discover and say you came across. But you could say that like, oh, I, you know, we discovered this nice little eatery downtown. You're just using the discover. The, the, the point of eliminating okay. discover is like... The word discover, the point of eliminating the word discover, you could do it, but at the end of the day, what were the what what what, what actually happened? Something was well, found that, that wasn't known for a group of people. Well, let's go to the definition of the word discover. It is to find something or someone unexpectedly in the course of a search. There you go. There you go. And and what, what Jim just said, so the Aboriginals actually discovered, on, in quotes, it, liked it, and stayed. Absolutely. Possibly. That, we don't know. Well, they were there. Right. Oh, well, maybe they were there always and stuff and this and that. But no. But let's say, let's assume that they... And it's you could you could you could make an argument that years and years and years and years into antiquity pre-written that they came there, discovered that area, and established it. That does not eliminate using the word discovered for Christopher Columbus, Europeans, all the way every day. Right. But it limits that discovery right. for their group of people. To find something or someone unexpectedly or in the course of a search. Right, right. So, so all I'm saying is that that because of the political ramifications of modern times, and there are huge people look at at um, uh, Columbus with a certain lens, and the less close to Columbus you are as far as a grouping of people, the more that that lens gets tweaked. But regardless. Because you know you're not associated in any way to that guy, and he was Italian at the end of the day. Although you know he lived in 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 Spain. And by the way, it. So the point is this: you, you people diminish the Columbus expedition because, or in, through my in my belief, because of those political ramifications. I understand that, but it's not accurate to say that he didn't discover. But I'd be willing to say. And Columbus stumbled upon. Okay. You know. <laughs> I, love it when, I love it when we redo old episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, just yanking your leg, man. Just yanking your leg. You about ready to land the plane? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I'll post that that video. Um, they don't I'd get like in, to see it. Yeah, they don't get into this... I'm just talking about the conversation that I had, which was an interesting conversation. Sure. This video is a thing unto itself in a very 
I found it very, uh, uh, I, I, I gravitated towards it very quickly. So, because it's interesting, you know, the whole history and all that. But, um, all right, let's 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 land the plane. Okay. Ain't nothing more. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. All right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on this Tuesday night. I'm so tired of getting punchy. I was I, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning, so I'm sitting here going, <laughs> and the stupidest things are funny to me right now. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening. Hope to see you all next week, and maybe Jim will remember we're on. It's not like we change dates or times. Although what we ought to do is we ought to just next week do it on a Wednesday just to frost his cupcakes, you know? <laughs> nah, I All wouldn't right. do that to him. Sure I would. No, I wouldn't. Or would I? Thanks for hanging out with us, y'all. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>